Uh, good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can all see and hear me. My name's Michael Ward. I'm the Principal Officer in the Spatial Strategy Team at Glasgow City Council, uh, and I'll be your chair this morning for this event. So thank you very much for attending. Um, unfortunately, we're still in the, the online world. It would be good to be in a room to, to be able to share this um, seminar with you. Um, but we're still online at the moment. So thank you very much for attending. Um, the programme this morning is to introduce you to the River Activation Programme, um, give you some background to that, and tell you a wee bit more about the, the art of the possible and the potential um, of this programme for activating the River Clyde. Um, the, the session's effectively split into two sessions this morning. The first will be, uh, we have short presentations or um, guest speakers coming on to tell you a wee bit about temporary urbanism, uh, and the River Corridor and the art of the possible, if you like, so to give you some inspiration for potential projects. So we have three speakers and following that we'll have a Q&A session where we have a chance to ask questions of the three speakers uh, and then we'll have a, a short break and in the second half of the session we'll tell you a wee bit more about the, the sort of nuts and bolts of the River Activation Programme and what we're trying to achieve and why we're trying to achieve that and the importance of the River Corridor. Um, so hopefully you can. that's all uh, clear to you. What we would encourage you to do is during the, the speakers, we'll have the Q&A session at the end of the three speakers this morning. Um, but while people are speaking, if we would encourage you to use the, the question function within the programme, if you can see that, rather than the, the chat function. If you type your questions there, um, then we'll pick those questions up as we go along and put them to our speakers in the Q&A session. Um, so we'd encourage you to do that as we're going through the, the session in order that you don't perhaps forget your question or miss the opportunity to ask it. If you just use that question function, we'll pick them up. Um, I think that's probably enough from me. Um, you'll hear from me a wee bit later about the, the River Strategic Development Framework, which is the, the document underpinning this. But I think without much further ado, we'll hand you over to our three speakers this morning. Uh, the first of those, uh, and I'm sure he'll introduce himself properly, is Brian Evans, who is the City Urbanist uh, and advisor to Glasgow City Council on all matters uh, relating to design. Um, so over to you, Brian. You have the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Michael. Good morning uh, to you all. Uh, Michael, could you wave at the screen? You can hear me okay? Yeah, cool. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. So I got 10 minutes uh, and 10 points. Um, the, the first thing uh, I should say is, of course, that these um, online platforms are wonderful and they've got some fantastic um, technology uh, built in, which you will all be able to enjoy this morning. But the one thing that they don't do, of course, is allow us, as Michael said, to, to see who's present. Um, and I can see your names appearing in a list, um, but you'll need to forgive me because um, there's every possibility that I know quite a lot of you, um, but I can't take it for granted that you know what I do or um, uh, the things that uh, I, sh I should say. So you forgive me for that uh, if I say a word or two um, about what the City Urbanist does. Um, the, the, the mandate for the, the city urbanist um, is, is to act as an independent advisor to the city's leadership. Michael actually summarized that extremely well. Um, and I don't think there's, there's really any need for me to, um, to develop on that other than to say it's an outreach role as well. Uh, so there is a, a role for me in projects like this. And I was very pleased uh, when Michael and his colleagues uh, asked me to, to say something this morning uh, to be able to uh, reach out um, between uh, the city council, uh, between communities uh, and indeed the design community uh, in terms of focusing our attention, well, these days uh, on COVID recovery and perhaps more importantly uh, on uh, climate justice and social justice. Uh, and all of the issues um, surrounding uh, the um, challenges uh, that we face in terms of climate change. Um, and with a rather large thump, the International Panel uh, on uh, Climate Change report landed uh, last week, 
all 4,000 pages of it. No, I, I haven't read it all yet, but I've read the, the summary uh, and there is a lot to be done. Uh, of course, Glasgow is hosting COP26 uh, uh, later this year, uh, and the city is intent uh, on playing a leadership role amongst cities for its citizens uh, in terms of um, addressing the challenges uh, of uh, climate change. Um, the, uh, the next thing I, I, I would like to say is I very much welcome uh, the strategic development framework for the river. Um, now that's online and I'm sure that uh, some of my colleagues this morning will be telling you more uh, about that. It's a medium to long term uh, plan for the river through, uh, through the boundaries of the city of Glasgow. Um, it's ambitious, um, it's very welcome. Um, but uh, it is medium to long term. It can't happen tomorrow. There's a lot needs to be done in order that um, the preconditions to enable uh, some of its ambitions um, put, can be put in can be put into place and into practice. Um, and therefore, the river activation program uh, that we are all here to discuss this morning becomes really very important. It is what we might do now and how we might start to, to think more uh, about the river. Um, it is, I think, um, a, a, um, an effort by the city um, to start the process of a dialogue uh, around about the river, to encourage us to bring the river back into our lives and into our consciousness for for too long the river has been fenced off um, sites along the river have been fenced off um, and this is um, a very welcome program to begin that dialogue um, and to try to find a way uh, to animate uh, the river and animate spaces uh, along the river. You will hear a lot today uh, about meanwhile uses. Um, meanwhile, meantime, means exactly what it says. Um, it is uses that might take place in the short to medium term uh, to allow uh, spaces that otherwise could not be used to be used in some way productively. And that's a very, very uh, interesting device that is used in urbanism these days um, where people can reclaim uh, the use, reclaim the perception of spaces and places that have been forgotten about. Um, and Glasgow has done well with this, with the stalled spaces program, for example, and I know you'll hear more about that on the program this morning. However, um, it, it is important to stress, um, as I'm sure all of you know, um, that um, the enabling of this uh, program comes about through grant aid from Scottish Government and public money comes with conditions. So there are, of course, um, conditions, hurdles to be cleared, um, which is the purpose of, uh, of today, particularly the second part of today. And at the same time, although we will all be enthusiastic uh, about um, embracing the, the, the use uh, of the river and bringing it back into our uh, uh, psychology and our consciousness, um, there are safety rules uh, that need to be considered for sites along the river. Uh, we have a fantastic river in Glasgow. Uh, it's often calm, uh, but it can be dangerous too, um, particularly to the currents uh, in the river, which flow differently on the surface and below the surface. 
Um, but I know that from my own experience earlier in my career working in the Glasgow Garden Festival, um, the enthusiasm uh, for um, the river that exists uh, in the minds of Glasgow people and the communities, particularly those uh, along the river. And so finally, uh, to try to, to, to wrap up uh, in this introductory uh, section, I really welcome this um, as city urbanist. I encourage you all um, to uh, grasp it with both hands. Um, I know that uh, Michael and his colleagues uh, in the city who are um, administering this program will do everything they can to overcome the hurdles that I mentioned to you uh, and the rules and the regulations. And in that regard, um, I would encourage you, if you are considering uh, putting in a bid um, or have already uh, made an expression of interest um, or towards the, the, the middle and upper end of the, of the funding that's available, to consider using a designer to help you navigate uh, these rules, uh, these rules and regulations. Um, so how do we be imaginative? How can we um, be uh, insightful? How can we be imaginative? Uh, how can we bring some of these spaces to life uh, in a way uh, that we maybe hadn't thought possible? Um, and turning to a member of the design community might well be a way to do that. Um, I guess if, if there are many of you already uh, on the call who are from community groups, um, established community groups, well, you'll have your ways of uh, being able to access uh, um, designers uh, and no doubt you will know many and perhaps many live uh, in your neighbourhood in any case. Uh, but I do uh, campaign uh, for the imaginative ideas that can come through, uh, such as the stalled spaces, such as test unit in recent years, um, and help us all start to change the psychology uh, of the river that runs through the city. So, Michael, those were the things I wanted to uh, try to raise, try to encourage people, welcome the programme, support you and your team in terms of what you're doing uh, with the project. And I look very forward very much to hearing the other presentations uh, and the discussions later on this morning. Thanks, Michael. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, I think that's probably a, a great summary of everything that we're trying to achieve um, for the River Corridor, but also highlighting, I think, perhaps some of the challenges of the of the process, and I can see the one or two questions coming in already uh, around that that will address the Q and A. But thank you very much, Brian. I think that was a, an excellent introduction to the to the purpose of this morning. And the, um, as I said, we'll as we get through the morning, we'll talk a wee bit more about strategic development frameworks and various other things. And hopefully, by the end of it, people will understand exactly what these things are and what they're trying to achieve. Uh, but but thank you very much for that, Brian. Um, our second speaker is Carleen Doherty, and hopefully, as I said, I'll get Carleen's title right. Carleen is the Vacant and Derelict Land Project Manager at the Development Trust Association for Scotland. And as part of her presentation, Carleen, hopefully, will give you some inspiration uh, and some, some useful pointers towards the type of project that we're trying to generate through this programme. Um, so without uh, any further ado, I will hand you over to Carleen for her presentation. Thanks, Michael. Um, so, yeah, as Michael just introduced me, I am Carleen Doherty. I work for Development Trust Association Scotland, and I'm running a partnership project with DTAS and the Scottish Land Commission, which is supporting communities to transform vacant and derelict sites. And as Michael said, I've been asked to speak today to provide some inspiration about what other organisations across Glasgow and further afield have been doing to tackle sites and bring them back into use. So the first topic I'm going to speak about is food growing. Food growing, uh, as you can see in these two photos here, two photos from one from the north and one from the south of the city, is a fantastic way to activate a site. It can it brings all sorts of benefits. Um, 
directly from the, the people who are able to use those sites to have some space to be able to grow and also a program of help coaching to, to learn um, the, about how, how to do that for themselves. But it also um, has benefits for, for climate change and um, can often be quite an antidote to the built up environment that all, we, a lot of us who live in the city are surrounded by. It's a pocket of green to enjoy, to spend time in and can be brilliant for people's health and well-being. One thing to be aware of, I think what you'll notice in both of these photos is that both the groups have chosen to grow in raised beds. And that's because they aren't, um, there's uncertainty perhaps about what the land was previously used for and therefore what the ground conditions are under the ground. So to overcome this, they've chosen to grow in raised beds. Um, and what's particularly interesting about the site on the right is that they have had their raised beds designed um, so that they are able to be lifted by a telehandler and moved on to another site should they have to vacate the site at any point. And that's all part of using a site in a temporary meanwhile um, way, knowing that it uh, you will likely only have the site for a set amount of time and you might then have to move on. So that's stuff to be thinking about as you're designing what you want your project to be on a site. If you'd be able to move on to the next slide, please. And these are some um, examples of how some organisations are taking that urban farming and growing element that bit further. So there's multiple examples um, throughout the city of where community organisations have been using a site um, for a community growing and they've cornered off part of that site and they have either got chickens and there's also lots of examples of bees. Um, beehives being kept on site and they're separated um, from the other parts of the site in this instance by um, a, a, a netted off area so that should the bees swarm there's a bit of separation between the people um, who are enjoying the garden and the bees. If you'd be able to move on to the next slide please. Another idea that you might be considering to activate a space is creating a, a, a play environment and there's lots of different ways that you could do this. So at the top left here, you're seeing quite a natural, informal play space. And this is within a woodland that's surrounded by uh, sort of tenement buildings. And so to have a natural play space in woodland that kids can come and have a different playing experience to backcourts or playgrounds is really is a really um, vital space for those kids who really enjoy it. And on the right hand side, this is a different type of play again. Um, this is a play event um, where a community organisation had organised use of a site for a set period of time and all they had to do to make that site usable was to mow the grass and then from that point during the summer holidays, just the summer holidays there, kids were invited down with their families to build um, dens and towers out of reclaimed materials empowering them to use a space that's been fenced off for you know their whole lives they've been walking past a fenced off site they're now able to go in and use that site and learn to use power tools and they had a fantastic time so they're just two ideas about how people can use sites but you could also make a site more playful and um, rather than designating a specific play space you could just generally be looking to make a site more playful uh, and colorful and inviting through by, in this instance, painting a maze on the ground or hopscotch, these sorts of things. It's just about changing how people interact and what they think that they can and should be doing in that space. If you'd move on to the next slide, please. Um, and biodiversity in nature is something that I would encourage groups to think about, regardless if it's the core aim of what you're wanting to do, or if your core aim is play space, but actually biodiversity in nature is a key part of what how you experience and what's already on that site. A lot of the sites that might be derelict along the river are already starting to naturalise. And so quite often there is already um, different types of wildflower and often a lot of buddleia. And I would encourage people to think about how you can plan your, your site use around making the most of what's already there and protecting it and then potentially adding to it. So some really low key intervention ways of doing that are 
by adding planters using you know here's recycled bottles um creating planters to add more variety to fencing and i think that something that's quite important about biodiversity in nature is especially in the city um it's about creating spaces where people can enjoy that and appreciate that biodiversity in nature so having seating um and be that close if that is close to the river obviously thinking about barriers and things like that um as you can sort of see in this this picture here but signage um and information to let people know what's on the site um and um pathways and things like that as well all add to how people can appreciate the biodiversity nature and nature in that space if you'd be able to move on to the next slide please so Art and exhibitions are just an, is, is another thing that you might be thinking to do on that site to activate that space. And like biodiversity in nature, it might not be the core thing that you're planning to do on that site, or, or it might be. But if it isn't the core activity you're planning on that site, you might still be thinking about adding artwork um, to make a site more lively and inviting. Um, or it might be that actually you're planning on holding exhibitions there to invite people to that site to come along and experience a space that would previously have been closed off to them. These are all photos of um, artwork being used in a different way, where artwork has been created um, involving members of the community. So inviting people to be involved in changing that site. Um, and I particularly like the example in the middle from Brayside Community Gardens, whereby they already had graffiti on the, this wall in their site, um, but they engaged with a, a local artist and got the kids involved to develop it further. And, and um, the, the kids were actually involved in um, drawing it out on the wall. So it is an exhibition space, but it's also um, a community involvement in the art um, space. So yeah, there's different ways that, ways of creating making the space more interactive and um, more inviting. If you could move on to the next slide, please. And that goes for exhibitions and events and concerts as well. If you've got created a space that you um, might be growing on a site, the story doesn't need to end there. You can invite a different demographic of people who might not have been originally engaged in the developing and growing on that site by having um, some cultural events and activities um, on that site which would activate it at different times of day with different types of people. So a really nice example of this is at the top left there um, where Gamis over the last few weeks um, in the south side have activated a derelict land by having an open air cinema and they had a screen that was there um, consistently for the few weeks and everything else was able to be the, the, the tables, chairs and pop-up gazebos were able to be put back in storage and brought out for, for each of the film screenings. And that was a series of events um, of films showing different um, focuses over the course of a few weeks. And of course, the same thing could be done with community campfires, sing-alongs and in the top right here, um, a gig as well. So um, if you could move on to the next slide, please. Oh, yeah, the same, similar again, similar to um, a pop-up cinema or concert, you can have pop-up markets, pop-up um, like food um, cafes, stalls, things like that, or in the middle here, a flower market, say, if you were growing stuff on site. The opportunities for pop-up events to add diversity to what you're doing on a site are, you know, the, they're endless, the world's your oyster and knowing what um, the community surrounding the site are interested in will be might be a key factor in what you're choosing to invite people to um if you could pop on to the next slide please some things to think about people often associate vacant and derelict sites as uninviting places where antisocial behavior takes place and part of this program is all about changing people's perception of those spaces. And there's a few key things that I would encourage you to think about um, to try to change the feel of a place when you're developing a project. 
So some of that is all about making the space accessible. So if the ground is uneven underneath, making sure that there aren't trip hazards as people are coming through sites, or if there's areas that you want to encourage people to go into and discourage other areas, then having bunting or different um, ways of separating a site um, will make people feel more secure in, in that space. Um, in order for people to um, want to spend time and enjoy being in the space, seating's a big factor in how long people want to spend time and linger there. And there's all sorts of ways in which you can create really um, interesting seating from reusable materials. This is just one that I, I really like the look of, and I think it would look fab on a site next to the river. Um, and finally, if you are planning on inviting people down to the site at different times of day, something to think about is lighting. And if the site will be very dark and if it needs to, there's pathways that need to be lit and different things like that. But you can install lighting in a quite a low, um, in quite a low key way. Um, just, um, yeah, there's different, different ways of doing that. And as Michael said, Brian said, sorry, a designer would be able to help with some of these elements. Uh, if you could just go on to my final slide. So with all the groups that I work with, I encourage them at the start of their project to think about the feasibility of what their plans are and what they would need to do, um, have on site to make those plans a reality. And so some key, key things to think about is if you're going to need power, is there power already on site? Can you connect to it? If not, can you use renewable energy sources like this community garden that has a solar panel? Same again goes with water. Would you, is there water on site? Can you connect to it? If not, can you harvest rainwater? Will that be good enough quality? And do you need storage on site? And finally, um, if you are thinking about growing, being aware of what's underneath the ground and if you would need to take that into consideration. I've got a couple of resources which I'm going to pop on the chat, which I think would be use, might be useful for some of you when planning your project. And that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carly. That was uh, excellent, and lots and lots of uh, useful ideas um, there for people that are thinking about it through the program. Uh, I've been frantically while well, um, Carly's been talking, trying to look through the questions that you've been submitting, uh, and where possible, perhaps type some answers. Uh, I'm noting that uh, quite a lot of the questions are coming in are around the sort of detail of the program, which hopefully we can pick up on much more in the second half of the program. Um, but so it would be good if, in the, for the first part of the session, if you have specific questions for the, the speakers based on what they've been presenting, that would be really good. Um, we will take other questions, and I said, well, we'll try and answer them as we go along, and we'll pick up on a lot of the detail around the nature of the programme and where the, the focus of the programme is in the second half of the session. Um, and, and bear with me, as I said, I'm trying to type as we go along to answer these questions. Um, on that, I'll introduce our next speaker. Um, we have Bill Fraser of the Pollock Shields Trust, who is going to talk to you specifically about the Pollock Shields Playhouse, um, which is a, an excellent example of temporary urbanism in the city. Um, so Bill has uh, been one of the driving forces behind this project, and we'll tell you a lot more about it in the next 10 minutes, hopefully. And then after that, we can go into the Q&A, where we'll try and pick up on some of these questions that you're submitting. Uh, but just a reminder, as I said, that the second half of the programme will get into much more detail about how the programme operates and uh, the sort of site-specific nature of it. Uh, and with that, I'll hand you over to Bill. Thanks, Michael, and good morning to everybody. Um, we uh, started a programme in 2015, 2016, uh, to animate um, a piece of land which did contain uh, a a useful, a useful building, but was going to be redeveloped by the uh, owners into housing. Um, rather unfortunately, it's still that way, but we had it for a year and we had a lot of fun trying to kind of make these things go. Um, let me explain, first of all, um, who we are. If I can have the next slide, please. Um, in East Pollock Shields, uh, this is the context of it. Uh, there we have a very high uh, number of um, youth and old people, more, more than the average in the city. We are uh, a 
very high minority ethnic group, but actually now in fact it comprises 53% uh, of the community. Uh, as a compared with the Glasgow average of about 12% and a Scottish average of about four. Next slide, please. Uh, we had already started before the opportunity to uh, do the Pollock Shields Playhouse came along uh, by uh, putting together a community-led charrette. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the charrette word, it's, uh, it's a kind of architect's term for a very intense um, uh, uh, sort of uh, communication with the local people. And out of all this, uh, we uh, got uh, a series of visions, um, which was talking about the general area and how we actually could move forward to do this. Now, the important thing about this was that this was a community-led charrette. So we were uh, fulfilling the idea in the Community Engagement Act that uh, communities should be involved in actually developing uh, a local plan. So everything we were doing has uh, led to eventually a local plan, which uh, is now being adopted, I'm pleased to say, um, by the city. And if I can ask the next slide um, to show me this. One of the big items that we found in, in talking to our local uh, population was that we had no active open space. Now, those of you who know Pollock Shields will know that it's surrounded by Queen's Park, uh, Pollock Park, and um, um, lots of other little, little and big spaces. But we worked out um, as a fun calculation that when you talked about usable green space, i.e. space that you as an average um, person could get there without the aid of um, a car uh, and so on and so on, actually was equivalent to an A4 sheet of paper per person. One of the other things that we noticed was that we had to try to develop wider social engagement. Uh, that meant that a lot of people felt that they had no place in trying to develop this sort of culture. But we, uh, and I'll show you how uh, we did it in a moment, uh, with the uh, Pollock Shields Playhouse was an exemplar of how it can be done. We also wanted to encourage um, a volunteer culture uh, because uh, a lot of people felt that, yes, they wanted to do something to help, but if you don't define what they can do to actually uh, get involved in this and make it easy, then they will never, ever come forward. So we did a lot of that. Um, we also uh, tried to focus on the activities which engaged the majority of uh, res residents uh, so that we were not making a sort of uninformed um, a guess at what was going on. Next slide, please. So in um, 2015, we successfully applied for funding from various sources um, uh, to put together something we called Pollock Shields Playhouse. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this was as recorded by the council. Um, it was an old uh, depot. Um, it was organized by Pollock Shields Community Council at the time, which is um, the, the original um, organization that's, um, that's doing it. Uh, the trust was subsequently formed because the responsibilities and the um, impacts coming from the charrette couldn't be handled by a community council because of the various restrictions on uh, their um, way of working. We had a lot of very good partners in this. Uh, we had uh, talking about designers earlier on, uh, the property company themselves, um, South Seeds, who some of you may know are a well-established uh, uh, organization um, in Southside. Um, Baxendale Architects, the Agoja designer, and um, we moved it forward uh, with a total funding of about £22,000 to actually get it off the ground. Um, next slide, please. Now, what I'm going to do now is to show you a short three-minute film uh, which concentrates on how we got things going. And um, there will be, after that, you'll see basically how we engage people and the sort of things we had to do to make it work. And I'll talk more about that afterwards. So um, next slide and film. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
there we are. Um, that's the um, next uh, the next slide, please. Um, the uh, we gave an example there of how it was basically done on volunteer, uh, all volunteers, uh, except for we did actually design, we did actually employ a designer, which I heartily recommend, and somebody with um, previous experience. Uh, the guy was called Lee Ivett, and he'd already put together um, a play. Um, Play, playground in the East End, and he was very good. So these are, these are just random shots of people um, who are doing things and what's sort of made the thing buzz. Um, they were all volunteers. So um, you see examples there um, of um, uh, we uh, when we had cinema, we had, of course, we had to have um, a, uh, if you can go back one, please. Um, they had this, uh, uh, this one here where we had, uh, if you were going to come to cinema, of course, you would look for a lady with a tray of um, sweets or ice creams. Um, when we were doing uh, classic, uh, classical katak dancing, um, of course, uh, the dancers were very pleased to have the um, enthusiastic uh, uh, sort of participation of uh, local kids. And so we did that as another example. Uh, next slide, please. And one of the most um, uh, uh, popular thing uh, was what we called Pollywood. And that was a tribute to the famous um, Indian cinema uh, series. And um, that was universally uh, acceptable. Now you'll see there it is um, in sort of half reasonable weather. Um, I should say this um, thing went on for about, um, oh, uh, well, through the winter, and just looking at some of the next slides, if you could show me the next slide, please, uh, kind of talks about what we had to put up with. We didn't have, um, as has been recommended by Carlene, any proper electricity, so we had to bring it in with generators, which we were able to do, um, and we had to use uh, old shipping containers as the, the, the place where we were uh, most interested in, in getting people. So next slide, please. We actually got um, a bit of uh, publicity uh, in the National and actually in the Guardian too. Can't find that one. But basically what this says is that, uh, you know, we invited the community to build it with us and come up with a program of events. And that's what's happening. Space being created as a laboratory to experiment uh, with ideas and see what happens. After that, uh, the key thing to this was having a steering group of local people. Uh, this was not the community council or somebody, a big, some big uh, idea about telling you what you're going to like. So everything developed. And one of the things I always remember uh, as a quote from people is that people used to say to me, you know, I've been walking around Pollock Shields for five years, pushing my buggy or going my shopping, and I'd I'd actually find somebody who looks interesting to talk to, but being Scottish, we never actually do that sort of thing. So then they re-found them in a common interest in uh, the Pollock Shields Playhouse. And uh, if I can ask for the next slide, please. Pollock Shields Playhouse became the Bowling Green in Pollock Shields. Now, many of you who are around the South Side will have heard of the Bowling Green, but it grew out of um, the uh, this and, of, and part of the funding application we made from uh, aspiring communities was showing what we'd done at the Pollock Shields Playhouse. So what now, instead of the Pollock Shields Playhouse for one year, next slide, please, we've got um, the Bowling Green. Now, it's now a permanent community common, not far from where the original playhouse was. It's open seven days a week, and it's got a monthly footfall of about 6,000 mostly local people. Um, we have also got in there a community garden. Uh, we run an interface with the local NHS for green prescribing. So if you're like me, a little bit old and a little bit overweight, you'll go to the doctor who will give you your pills and say, here's a prescription for six day digging at the community garden. So it all kind of works. We also have music, exercise, festivals, and uh, oh, quick plug. We're looking for trustees. So if anybody wants to be a trustee of the Bowling Green, see me afterwards. 
And that's basically the story of uh, what the uh, original Bullet Shells Playhouse led to, an established uh, intervention which meant that we could reach all of the people in our area on a much more level basis. I hope that's an inspiration to some of you. Thank you very much. Hi, Bill. Indeed, uh, it is a very inspiring project. Thank you very much for sharing that. I particularly enjoyed this as well. It's very awesome. Spaces for the kids to jump up and down in the deep water, which is always a, an important part of, uh, of any programme. Thank you for that. As they go into a, a Q&A session just now, as I said, I've been trying to answer the answer questions where I can uh, go along. But if we uh, start the Q&A session now, we've probably got about... Uh, you know, 20 minutes to go through this. Um, and as I said, if there are more questions that come up, and I said a lot of the questions I think we could probably answer better in the second half of the programme about the detail of what we consider that the process for it. Um, but if we could start a few of these sessions, that would be really helpful to the panels when we could come back online. Um, okay, so hopefully um, those presentations will give you a bit of a flavour uh, and some ideas or inspiration for the kind of thing that we're trying to do. Uh, not obviously restricted to similar projects, but I think that gives a, a broad idea of the, the idea behind some temporary organism and activation of these sites. Um, this is very much, as we've said, in some of the answers a pilot programme. Brian and reference the half conditions of the funding. So the first stage uh, is very much focused on vacant and derelict land and sites you know, on the vacant, vacant and derelict land register for, for some time. Sorry, I'm just trying to fix my mic there. I think somebody commented that I, I sent a private message to say my mic was a bit noisy. Um, so I think we'll start perhaps with a nice, easy question um, that I'll give to, to Brian. Um, how do you find how do you find a designer? Yeah, it's good. It's a good question. Uh, it's it's not such an easy question actually. Um, but let me first of all just say how inspirational um, Carlene and Bill's presentations were. It was fantastic, and I would say to everybody who's on the call today, you can't buy this stuff. Uh, the, 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 the 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 sort of things that Bill has been able to achieve with other local people. Um, is just wonderful. It's just outstanding. And Glasgow's future, um, to a greater or lesser extent, lies with people like Bill and the people he's worked with uh, and with the network that uh, Carlene um, uh, fronts up. And of course, the city too, Michael, I don't want you to feel left out. Um, but uh, uh, when, we, when we come up, when we come to face uh, a lot of the challenges that we need to face uh, with climate change. We're only going to be able to do it um, if we do it together uh, and if people become invested in their local area and if they're supported to be invested uh, in their local area. So the sort of examples that we've seen from these two presentations are absolutely on the button. Um, and the program that you and your colleagues are developing in terms of the river, river animation is also on the button. We just have to keep doing this. We've got to keep doing more of it. Um, so to turn to the question you asked me, uh, Michael, <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, there are, uh, it's, it's difficult for, uh, I understand it's very uh, difficult for you in the City Council, you're not able to, to make recommendations for particular individuals. What I would suggest is um, that people speak to other community groups. Um, I can be a little bit freer in my comments. Um, I know Lee Ivett, we work together at Glasgow School of Art. Um, uh, Lee is fantastic. Uh, and the work he does uh, and others in his network do um, for engaging with communities. And the more that we uh, do that, 
um, the more it will be known about. So I, I would suggest that the, the first um, and valuable uh, way to find designers is by word of mouth through um, other community groups, to chat to them about their experiences. You can, of course, also approach, for example, um, the Architects Institution. You can uh, approach the Landscape Institute um, and they will give you lists of people who do this sort of work. I would really underline and echo what Bill said, um, that you're wanting to try to get to designers who are minded to become involved in this, um, in this type of work and have experience in it. Uh, it is actually something that demands skill, expertise and experience to be able to work alongside people understand their uh, aspirations and their needs. Um, but I, I'm sure as well, uh, Bill and Carlene, Michael could probably uh, offer observations um, for uh, the people on the call today about the best way to access, um, the best way to access designers. In fact, I imagine Carlene's probably got a register um, or if she hasn't got a register, she knows somebody who's got a register. <laughs> Um, of, uh, of, of designers who do community engagement work. And there are a lot of them uh, active in Glasgow in the west of Scotland. Um, so I'll, st I'll stop at that point and ha hand over to, to my colleagues here, Michael. Thanks for that, Brian. Um, yeah, as I said, there are a lot of very talented designers around. Um, so we would want you to point you to anybody specifically, but there are resource packs. Um, one of the things that we do, and I think it's come up as a question, uh, perhaps we'll cover this a wee bit in the next question that I'll, I'll give to, I'll throw to Carlene, I think. Um, but given that it's, uh, it references our presentation at the start of it, but it's asking about um, how communities perhaps find out about what's possible. Um, and is there a, a sort of resource pack for new communities that might be available as part of this process? Um, before you answer that, I think there's another question that, that talks specifically about that, about putting together a kind of resource pack. And I think that's something that we would, we've done certainly for stalled spaces in the past, where there's a good website that gives you examples of projects that have been delivered. And I think that's something that we'll do going forward for this project as well. Um, but Carlene, do you want to maybe say something just about that, the idea of kind of resource packs or resources for community groups who might be interested? Um, yes, there are so already been shared by myself and others who are, are listening to the webinar. There have been a number of resources which have been shared in the chat, um, wh which I would I would point people towards because one of them I was actually going to share myself, but it already been shared by the time I got to, to at the end of speaking. So yes, there are the, the I would also recommend the stalled spaces um resource pack there isn't i think a resource pack that is prescriptive and tells you what x y and z you should be looking at but as a community by looking at what other groups have done and taking inspiration from that and maybe matching that up to if you've already had any consultations in the past either undertaken by yourselves or um, by other organizations as part involving your community matching up ideas and inspiration with what you feel is lacking and you would like to address in your community and seeing these sites as a vehicle for making that happen, an opportunity to try something out. There are, looking to the future, um, resources coming out that I've been involved in working on with the Scottish Land Commission, um, which is going to, it's a decision tree for community-led action on vacant and derelict land. That isn't live yet, but it will be um, in October, I think. And that's um, going to guide you through some of the different things you need to think about and point you towards lots of different um, organisations that can help as well. So there is resources out there. If I think of any more in the next few minutes, I will put more in the chat um, and they can be shared. And what Brian was saying about um, engaging a designer, um, Absolutely, there are lots of designers out there would agree with what Brian said, get in touch with other community organisations, find out their experiences, who they would recommend is what I would definitely recommend myself. 
um, someone who knows the site, someone who um, knows the type of project and has experience of working with community organisations um, and truly listening um, to what those people want um, are the key skills you'll be looking for. Okay, thank you very much, Carleen. I think um, there are a number of specific questions that have been directed to Bill. Um, so I'll bring you in now, Bill. One of those is around social prescribing. Uh, I suppose a fairly straightforward question. Do the NHS pay you for that service? Um, Not yet. Do you want me to answer that now? <laughs> Not yet. Well, if, um, if the answer yeah. is the yeah, no, then yeah. it's a fairly straightforward one. One of, one of the other questions, I think, uh, for you, Bill, was um, a comment or perhaps a question around the film that the, the area, the, the diversity that exists in Pollock Shields, um, perhaps wasn't fully represented in the film. Um, so the question is, you know, did, did you engage across the different communities that exist in Pollock Shields and how successful was that? Yeah, it's true. We we after we did the film, we suddenly realised that it still looked a bit sort of mono, monochrome, and um, we. But that doesn't actually represent uh, what subsequently happened. Um, if you look at uh, uh, the Facebook site for uh, the uh, Bowling Green, you'll see that that's been addressed. It was one of the lessons we took from that uh, that uh, we had to be much more positive about um, addressing the multicultural. Uh, nature of Pollock Shields, because the great thing about Pollock Shields is it's a quite a small um, neighbourhood. It's got about 9,000 people and about 50-50 BAME and not BAME. Uh, and the great thing about Pollock Shields is we all get on with each other. We don't see colour, we don't see religion. And it was how to perhaps bring out um, the, uh, the BAME part of this, because some of the traditions were that they were not putting the head above the parapet. So uh, you can, anybody who wants to take a look at that is welcome to come to the Bowling Green and see uh, that it is uh, absolutely addressed and it's in proportion to the, um, uh, the population and their interests. Thanks very much, Bill. Well, well, I've got you, I'll throw one more in your direction. Um, it's a question from uh, Imogen who has asked, how, how much do you think the forming and success of the local steering group was dependent on existing local skills and know-how in the area. And it, do you think this is something that might be important for other areas? Yeah. And um, I mean, the, the problem is um, that uh, when you start something like this, they are what I always recall, always call the usual suspects who would, um, um, you know, come to the opening of an envelope. But it's very important that you try, try to broaden that out because you will always get people who are are keen to do something, but by dividing the tasks down into specific uh, areas. So don't say to somebody, oh, I want you to volunteer for this because they'll run in the other direction. You say, I know you're pretty good at doing this. Could you give us maybe a plan for that particular aspect? And then gradually form them into a, a group. And again, um, we learned a lot from 2016 and putting together the, the Bowling Green because we do exactly that. And um, we make it clear, uh, we made it clear, by the way, at the Playhouse, that whereas a lot of people wanted to come and participate, they wanted to take their group to participate. And we said, absolutely not. If you open it up, it opens up to anybody who wants to come. And we've kind of overcome that now. It's taken a while, but it's very important that you um, sort of have... Um, you try to sort of seed it with people who are going to um, broaden it out. Okay, I'm, I'm aware of time um, and we, we want to move quite soon to the, the second part of the session where perhaps we're getting much more detail in the nuts and bolts of this. I think we'll finish with one more question and I'm, I think I'll give this one, I've, I've, I've allocated this one to Brian. Um, it's a question from Minty Donald. Um, and it's quite an interesting question that I think you um, might quite enjoy, Brian, uh, is how open is the scheme to projects that might be quite radical in challenging our human relations relationships with the river? Um, the, the question's a bit longer than that, Brian. I don't know if you have access to the question function that you can read it. Um, uh, let me see it, how 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 open I I've got I've got so, all I see is how open to the scheme. 
and I've got Minty Donald's name beside it, but I don't have anything more than that on my screen, Michael. Um, uh, well, I, I think to, I think to paraphrase in summary, I think the first part of it is probably the important bit about how open the scheme might be to, to projects that might be quite challenging and radical. Um, you know, out with the kind of contemporary economic frameworks or something quite different and radical. Uh, I think that's what Minty's asking about uh, in terms okay. of access to the river. Yeah, access to the river itself. Does Minty use the uh, the, the phrase access to the river itself? Well, but, uh, as I said, it's quite a long question. Uh, Minty's yeah. talked about imagining what ha might happen if the river was allowed to move and spread where it naturally wants to. Uh, okay. Talking okay. about global warming, climate change. So there's, there's, yeah. there's quite a lot of interesting stuff in there. Okay. Minty, I'm not seeing all of this, um, so I'll I'll try and uh, I'll I'll try and respond in respect of uh, uh, Michael's um, paraphrasing of it. There, I of course think that the scheme should be open to um, uh, radical thinking and imaginative thinking. Um, I think we need to think in these ways uh, for uh, the future of our city. Um, and we will certainly have to do to do that. Um, and we will certainly have to do it in terms of the increased volumes of water that we will need to deal with uh, coming down the river and coming up the river. Um, so I don't want to in any way dissuade you uh, f from that, but I would say that there are maybe a couple of guidelines that are worthwhile thinking about. Um, and the first one could be expressed as trusting the people. So I, I think what has been very interesting in terms of what we've heard this morning from Bill and from Carleen, uh, who's been using a whole variety uh, of examples. Bill has been much more specific about that. Um, I don't know where, he's, where, where Bill has acquired his insight and expertise, but he has done so in a wise way to, I, th I thought his little parable at the end there of uh, how to reel people in and, be, and, and get them involved um, uh, was, was, was very insightful. Well done, Bill. I mean, that, that is exactly the sort of, of approach that we need to adopt. I would suggest with this, with this series of projects, and it's only my view, um, that trusting communities to aspire uh, to, to, to what they aspire to try to do uh, in these spaces um, is, is, a, is a very good guide um, to actually be able to get something going. Uh, and the, the designers who have been mentioned uh, in, in the conversations this morning understand that proposition as well, that, that, the, the, that, that it's about engaging with people and trusting with people and helping them through some of the things that are counterintuitive um, that that becomes um, that becomes uh, um, a, a more surefire way to ensure that they remain involved and become involved because it's their project it becomes their project they take ownership of it um, bill in particular is is just guiding if you like so he, he's saying oh it's a great idea that you want to do this for your particular group but it's got to be for everybody that's that's such good guidance and advice however uh minty if if uh you are working with people and you wish to engage in some kind of polemic um i mean we saw early on uh in um uh, Carleen's presentation, uh, how uh, uh, she, uh, or, or at least one of the projects um, that, that um, Carly was, was, uh, Carleen was showing, um, was, had, had involved street artists. Um, and uh, one of the things I'm, I'm involved in at the moment is, is trying to help support uh, Lateral North in their COP fringe work that will take place uh, on the north side uh, of the river beside the, the Kingston Bridge. And there are, there are street artists involved in that. So there's a place for all of these things. Um, 
uh, and there's a place for thinking about it, there's a place for being provocative about it, but remember at the same time, of course, um, that the people that you will be asking uh, for this support from um, have been given uh, guidelines uh, in terms of how they, they are allowed to disperse the funds. Um, uh, so we can, I imagine we can be, we can be imaginative about that, um, but it can't be for anything. But, you know, I, I, would, I would just in, encourage all dialogue uh, about the river and all uh, discussion and all engagement um, about, uh, about the river, about how it can become part of our consciousness, um, about how um, it can become part of our consciousness for the 21st century and it's a different form of river uh, than the canalized river that was created for the industrial era. Um, and that's going to be very important. And we won't do it tomorrow, but we, we, should, we should be setting out on a course of action um, that does that. And that would certainly, I would think, Min Minty, need to include um, what the Dutch would call room for the river, room for the river to, to be what it needs to be. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to encourage you on one hand, um, and I'm trying to uh, encourage you to be uh, realist, to be both idealistic and realistic about what it is you can achieve. Um, uh, you, uh, you, you, um, if if you can do something uh, that excites people's imagination, that sensitizes them to uh, some of the issues, but does so in a way that 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 um, can be steered through uh, the various hurdles. Uh, that will confront all of those who, who bid into the scheme. But as you've seen, again, from Caroline and Bill, there's a very wide range uh, of possibilities of, of what can get support. Um, and I think people want to be imaginative uh, in, in how that, that, can, that can come about. So I would, in, I would encourage that. And I, I, you know, I think if, the, if some sort of project comes through this that causes people to think, that's no bad thing, Minty. So if, if you're able to frame this in such a way that it causes people to think or it arrests their attention um, in, in some way and, and causes them to think about the river and its future, well, good on you. Um, but you need to, you'll need to get those lined up behind you, <clears throat> excuse me, to support you in that. Um, and of course, no better way of doing that than getting some of the people of Glasgow and the citizens of Glasgow uh, behind you uh, in in doing that as well. So I, right. I hope that's that's a, some kind of a help. A bit of a waffle, Michael. Apologies. Um, without seeing no, the exact wording of what Minty's written. That's <laughs> that's that's no problem, Brian. I think that was a, a good answer to to the question. And I said I think we uh, in the second half of the session we'll cover a wee bit more detail about the the nature of the the program and the kind of hurdles uh, that you've referenced, Brian, um, that inevitably are put in place um, in terms of a, a funding package. But uh, yeah, likewise, I think we would encourage people to be imaginative and to come forward with projects that, that kind of stimulate thought and, and bring activity to the river in perhaps ways that, that we hadn't thought about. Um, in terms of timing, I'm aware um, that, that we've, we've not answered every of these questions and the questions that have been posed, we will uh, keep a record of the questions and try to get back to you. And as I said, some of them will be picked up in the second part of the of the programme. We're proposing now that we take a, a short five minute break um, before we start that second part of the session, um, just to have a quick comfort break. Um, so at the time at the moment, I think it's just going on to 20 to 12. So if we start back again at 11.45, um, I see we're probably about five minutes late, but that should be that should be fine. We should be able to pick that up in the second half. Um, we'll keep presentations hopefully fairly short to allow time for more questions and answers. So if we see you back on at 11:45, everybody, and thank you very much. So for the second part of the program, as we said, we'll get into a bit more detail about the the I suppose the background, a wee bit of background first about the River Clyde and the strategic development framework. Um, which is the basis on which we've launched this river activation programme and sets the context for it. So, un uh, unfortunately, you'll hear uh, very briefly from me in the first presentation, uh, and then I'll hand you over to a colleague of mine, Ziba Aziz, who is um, 
part of my team and will sort of lead the programme and has been heavily involved uh, for a number of years now in the Stolen Spaces programme. So he's a, a very experienced officer on how we deliver these sort of temporary urbanism programme. So in the first instance, I'll run you through a very brief presentation about the, the river and the strategic development framework to set the contest. And then we'll go into a wee bit more detail about the, the programme itself and then again pick up some questions on that. Um, so if we could get to the correct point in the slides and we'll run through it perfect. Um, and I think Brian's touched on it uh, this morning, the importance of the River Clyde. Um, so we'll just, as I say, very quickly, I'm sure everybody knows about the history of the River Clyde, but the first couple of slides will just run very quickly through the importance of the River Clyde and how it's uh, effectively the heart of, of our city. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, this is, I suppose, going back into the kind of medieval times and the birth of a city, uh, very much based on the River Clyde and the the kind of hoarding potential in the, the market trading. Um, the, the, the first saw Glasgow grow as a city and as a centre for religion and education, in particular in medieval times. Next slide, please. We then move into, I suppose, the next big um, explosion, in the, if you like, in the growth and the wealth of Glasgow, which was based very much around the, the merchant uh, trading position of Glasgow. Um, particularly in terms of how the Clyde face west and goods come in from, from the Americas uh, to be transported across Europe, which saw a, a kind of exponential growth in population uh, in Glasgow and the, the role of the River Corridor. Next slide, please. Uh, moving on to the next phase, if you like, an industrialisation and perhaps Glasgow's, uh, the, the Clyde's most famous role uh, in shipbuilding and the Clyde built. Uh, being a real mark of quality globally in the shipbuilding industry. Uh, at the turn of the, the 20th century, approximately a fifth of the world's shipping was built in Glasgow. Uh, and as well as the number of people employed, you can see in the image in the bottom right, the number of people that come out to an event when a ship was launched. So again, the, the role of the Clyde is hugely important to the city and the growth in population that linked to that employment and all the other resources that that brought to the city. Next slide. I suppose then we enter the, the sort of post-war period and the, the start of the, the decline or the reversal of the might of the Clyde. Uh, you can see at the top the kind of Luftwaffe bombing plan for the Clyde uh, and the aftermath of that. And then as we as we move into the sort of post-war era, era and the end of uh, Glasgow's shipbuilding strength, if you like, um, which involved, again, you can see some of the images here in the kind of activism. Uh, and the kind of social aspects of that, the, the sit-in uh, and a strike to be given the right to work, which is perhaps quite unusual for a strike, where quite often people stop work. In Glasgow, they had a they had a work in where they locked the shipyard and continued to work. But all of this, I think, just emphasises the importance historically that the Clyde has had and the place that it has at the heart of the city. Next slide, please. In more recent times, we've we've seen significant investment and a bit of a rebirth of the Clyde as we as we bring new events and buildings to the River Corridor. Next slide, please. And obviously, you can see that in the skyline uh, of the River Corridor, where you see these kind of iconic buildings that exist along the River Corridor. Um, I think everybody knows all of these buildings now and can see them, but. Um, there has been significant investment and huge change in the River Corridor in recent years. And this is a, a symbol, a, 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 sorry, an emblem of that, these buildings that exist along the River Corridor. Next slide, please. Despite all of that investment, I think we're in a position where we still have a number of very significant challenges, if you like. Uh, we've referenced some of them this morning, particularly around environmental um, and social conditions on the River Corridor. The idea of flooding and climate change, vacant and derelict land, which is uh, a focus of this project, if you like, and uh, the development pressure that exists along the city. And also that uh, process of canalisation is now, in, in some instances, a couple of hundred years old, so that kind of Victorian infrastructure is starting to deteriorate. Um, next slide, please. And that's just some images of the of the challenges that we're talking about and we're keen to address as part of this process. You can see where the, the key wall has collapsed, for example, in the bottom centre. Uh, and this creates significant issues, particularly around ownership and 
access to the river corridor? Whose responsibility it is to repair that? Um, how do we deal with these significant areas of vacant and derelict land and the challenges that that brings? Next slide, please. But alongside that, we think there are huge opportunities linked to the redevelopment of the river corridor in, in terms of its potential um, as the heart of the city and the, the city's uh, ambitions for inclusive growth. Um, it is also the biggest open space in the city. That continual linear link right through the heart of the city it is something that a lot of cities don't necessarily have, um, but perhaps we don't take the best advantage of it at the moment, but there is a huge opportunity linked to that. Next slide, please. So, as part of this process and the Council's response to that, we were tasked with producing the, a strategic development framework for the River Corridor to set that kind of spatial um, strategy for the River Corridor going forward to, to 2050. As Brian referenced earlier, this is not something that we'll fix overnight. There are, there are significant challenges uh, and significant opportunities that exist. Um, but in terms of the complexity and the time taken to deliver that, it can take a long time. Next slide, please. So in terms of our vision for the River Corridor, I won't go through these one by one, but that idea of that kind of vibrant, inclusive, livable, well-connected place, everything we do at the moment has place and place-making at the heart of that. That idea of creating a destination and making the River Clyde a place again is perhaps the most important element of that. I think it was picked up in the, the questions this morning about that idea of the, the routes and the connections between some of these key iconic buildings and spaces is perhaps something that uh, we haven't taking best advantage over, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, so our vision is based on the, this idea of place making and creating a place um, along the river corridor that the city can be proud of once more. Next slide, please. And as part of that process, the, the SDF has identified a number of priorities. We think the Clyde is of national importance and hopefully the, 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 the national planning framework will pick up on that. Um, but we think the river Clyde is not just important to the city, we think it's important to, to Scotland and should be identified as such. And I think the, the Scottish Government's identification of the Clyde mission uh, reflects that uh, national importance of the River Corridor. We want development along the River Corridor to be sustainable. Um, we, we've talked and we've made reference to COP26. Uh, it's possible to ignore now the importance of climate change and the challenge that we face globally. Uh, and again, hopefully global um, the global interest in that will become local as part of COP26 and we identify uh, projects and a sustainable approach to the regeneration of the River Corridor in Glasgow. Uh, and as I'd said previously, that idea of the kind of design-led placemaking approach to enhance um, the townscape and the heritage of the environment of the city. Next slide, please. So in that regard, the, the strategic development framework picks up on these key themes from the city development plan. We're trying to create a, a vibrant river, um, a sustainable river, a connected river. You know, the, the river should almost be the kind of central spine of a connectivity network across the whole city. Uh, and that idea of a green and resilient river, um, creating a network of open spaces along that kind of linear space that exists through the city and how that connects to, to adjacent spaces. So is there an opportunity to look at how the River Clyde connects via the River Kelvin to the canal uh, and beyond into the rest of the city. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, a slide taken from the strategic development framework, that idea of placemaking and some of the ideas that we, we're encouraging you to think about as part of this program, but also we, which we will need to think about in the kind of longer term development aspirations for the River Corridor, about how you bring people back um, safely and how you develop at a kind of human scale. Uh, and reinforce those connections and bring that mix of uses that creates a kind of vibrant river corridor. Next slide, please. The final slide is really just, a, I suppose, some, some ideas globally. Um, a number of cities have identified the river as a key space within that. And you can see here just some international examples of how people have um, taken advantage of that opportunity to bring people back to the water. Uh, and that's something that we are very much keen to do in Glasgow. And I think that is the final slide. So as for the next part of the session, I will hand you over to Ziba, my colleague, who will tell you a wee bit more about the River Activation Programme. This has emerged very much from 
the, the, the kind of action plan linked to the strategic development framework, where we've recognised that in order to to achieve those kind of longer term ambitions, whether ever it's important in the short term to, to bring people back and to identify projects and opportunities for sort of short term or meanwhile uses, we can start that sort of process of activating the river corridor. So I will hand you over to Zeba, who will tell you a wee bit more about the, the programme itself and what we hope to achieve through that. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, hi, everyone. So um, the few slides here today are just to give an overview of the program and some of its um, priorities and objectives and some of the details on what the available sites are and what are some of the key um, conditions around the uh, participation in the program. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as Michael mentioned, um, the River Activation Program is actually a pilot project and an element of the action program of the recently adopted um, strategic development framework for the river corridor um, that envisions the corridor as a vibrant, inclusive, liberal, and well-connected place. Um, the program is actually um, programmed after the city's um, successful stall spaces program um, to support community-led meanwhile projects that stimulate interest, test uses, provide temporary greening, and animate the waterfront. Um, and the project, the program is funded through Scottish Government's Vacant and Delic Land Fund um, and also looks to meet some of the objectives of that fund, which include developing diverse, sustainable environments with a focus on temporary green space, as well as supporting communities to flourish and tackle inequalities. Um, next slide, please. Accordingly, so the priorities of the program are around um, stimulating interest and engagement with the river. Um, bringing the river activity to the river, animating the waterfront through temporary use, um, encouraging greater use of the river at different times of the day, um, engaging local communities, um, enhancing the city's relationship with the river, um, improving its access by local and wider communities, as well as supporting a healthy environment along the river uh, through an enhanced um, natural environment. Um, next slide, please. And as Carleen and Bill already mentioned, some of the types of projects we're looking for uh, under this program, obviously this site, um, this list is, is not comprehensive. It's just, you know, a list of idea, but, um, you know, things like greening of sites, um, event spaces, food growing initiatives, um, enhancements of routes to the river, uh, pop-up cafes, natural play spaces, um, basically projects that help um, connect the communities to the river as well as activate and improve these sites um, for the temporary measure. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, um, the program is funded through the Scottish Government's Vacant and Derelict Land Fund. Um, and as a condition of that fund, um, only sites that are above a certain size, so 0.1 hectares or 1,000 square meters, um, and have been on the vacant and derelict land register for more than 15 years um, are eligible for funding under this program. And so of the sites available, um, we have five sites um, along the river corridor that are eligible for this funding, as well as available for temporary use by community groups. So this is just a rough map of that. I will go into the details of each site um, soon. So as you can see, four of those sites are on the north bank of the river and one of the sites is on the South Bank. So next slide, please. Um, the first site, as you can see here, is on the west end of the, of the city in, this, in the neighborhood of Yoka. Um, it's, a, it's a linear strip of land um, along the Barton Road. Um, as you can see in the picture here, um, it's fairly overgrown. Um, it's, it's vacant right now, but is being overlooked by um, the tenement flats on the right you see there. Um, and is available for temporary use. It's 0.7 hectares, so it's a sizable site. Um, and for most of these sites, you'll see um, that they're quite sizable sites. And so we, we could envision um, multiple projects on single sites as well. Um, and this, this site is available um, up to a year. And depending on the project and the availability of site, there is a potential for rolling on from there. But the initial um, availability of the site is one year. Um, next slide. So these are just some pictures of that site um, looking west towards the city and then looking east um, just to show uh, the current conditions of the site and where it sits 
um, with regards to the um, its local context. Um, next slide, please. Um, the second site is moving um, east towards the city. We have a site next to the um, Glasgow Harbor um, area. This is a fairly big site. Um, roughly uh, five hectares of that is usable for temporary projects. Um, the availability of the site is up to a year again. Um, and as per the in principle agreement um, that has been agreed upon with the site owners, there are some conditions to its use. Basically, the access to the river, the key site is um, open. Um, and so it doesn't have a protected key site. And so any project that goes on it would have to have some sort of a protection to, um, to prevent uh, basically unrestricted access to the open key site. Um, the owners have also noted that the surfacing in, in some areas might be uneven. Um, so any proposals would need to take um, that into account for, for the specific proposal. Um, and the owners have also um, included that if there were any commercial users to be uh, going on to the site, for example, um, pop-up pop-up cafes or such, then um, a rent would be charged. But as of now, you know, if uh, under the general categories, um, this is available for free for up to a year um, under this program. Next slide, please. So just some pictures of the site again, um, looking west, um, looking east towards the city, um, showing the expanse of the site. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly large site again, and um, fairly overgrown in parts. So that's something to take into consideration as well. Um, next slide, please. The third site is a much smaller site. Um, it's along, along the same um, area, um, just east of um, the Glasgow Harbor residential development. Part of that site is being used, has been designated for residential parking, as you can see in one of those pictures on the top right. Um, this is a fairly um, sort of treated site. So as you can see in the picture there, um, there's a fairly even surface. Um, it's fairly, uh, fairly big and there is obviously due to the residential development there there is potential to engage with some of the uh, residents there next slide please um, as you can see again you know the, the it's vast expanse of the site some of it is being used for parking but there's still a significant portion of the site that's available for temporary use again this site is available up to a year for temporary use um, next slide please the fourth site is a it's a fairly bigger site, um, part of which has been used for um, student residential development recently. But there's still a huge segment of the site that is currently undeveloped. Um, it can be accessed from the west side, um, as you can see in the top right picture. Um, it's a fairly big site, um, overgrown in some places, available up to a year, and the similar conditions as the previous sites in terms of access to the river, um, you know, in terms of safety around that, um, issues around surfacing, um, you know, uh, instances of uneven surfacing in some areas. Um, and then again, the, the issue around commercial use and, you know, possibility for a rent around that. Um, again, it's a very big site. It's up to, uh, you know, seven hectares. So there's possibility of multiple projects there. Um, so, and some pictures on the next slide, please. Um, to just um, show the existing conditions of, of the site. Where the residential development is, uh, the student, it's, it's boarded up around that. So the access for the site is from the um, west end of the site. Some of that area is uh, being used as a temporary um, holding area for the construction. Um, so a site visit would be good to see what, what parts of the site are available uh, for temporary use. Next slide. And the final site is on the south um, bank of the river around the Pacific Key. This is a fairly, compared to the others, this is a fairly smaller site. Um, but again, this is um, well treated and um, quite a stable um, sort of a landing there. Um, it's undeveloped um, and it's uh, open to temporary proposals uh, with an availability of up to a year initially, um, depending on the proposal and then depending on the you know, long-term plans for the site eventually. Um, next slide, please. And some pictures of the site, as you can see, you know, there's some uh, nice views of Pacific Key around there and the site is fairly even and untreated. So this was, um, next slide, please. So this was just a quick overview of the sites available, the five sites available. 
all of these sites are um, you know owned by different entities um, ranging from glasgow city council scottish enterprise peel ports and um, under this program we have a principal um, agreement in principal agreement for the temporary use of these sites um, for most sites up to a year um, based on the program and the project um, and they're basically eligible for up to a year um, under this program. Um, some of the additional details for the program, um, under this program only constituted not-for-profit groups um, can apply, uh, are elig eligible to apply, uh, but we do encourage partnership working um, in delivering, in developing and delivering these projects um, that would allow involvement of community groups, local groups, individuals, and other non-constituted groups that are otherwise in ineligible to apply to be part of the project. So we, we definitely encourage that and we'll be looking for that in applications as well. Um, the funding available through this program is from a minimum of 5,000 pounds to um, a maximum of 20,000 um, pounds, relating to, of course, the scale and the impact of the project. Um, the applications are now open. Um, the way to apply is through an online application form on the webpage. Um, and the deadline for the same is Friday, the 24th September. Um, on the webpage, you'll also see an application guidance document um, that will provide further information on things like, you know, ineligible costs, what the criteria of judgment for judgment would be, um, and also an, a template for the online application form if you're, you know, filling it um, with other groups uh, and you want to fill it before, before um, filing it online. Um, so just a few sort of additional details on the program. Next slide, please. And this is just a snapshot of what the web page looks like right now. So as you see on the right hand side, we have the online application form. Um, and in the same column down below, you will see the guidance notes that I was just referring to. And also a document with all these, uh, the five eligible sites with the maps and the locations and the conditions um, and the time period they're available for. Uh, on the left hand side, we have the key priorities, and as I had mentioned in the, earlier in the presentation, um, the type of projects we're looking for, uh, details around funding, eligibility criteria, and then how to apply. So hopefully all of this will be fairly straightforward, but obviously if you have any questions or you have further interest, you know, we're happy to um, respond by email as well. So please let us know. Um, so that'll be all. Thank you for listening and we'll take some questions as well. Thank you. Hi there, thank you very much, Zipa. Uh, a comprehensive presentation on the on the project itself. There are a lot of questions that have come in. We will, um, given the, the, the time limitations, if there are any questions that we've not answered today, we will be keeping these questions and we'll try to get back to everybody individually on any questions that feels not been answered. Um, so we'll try and pick up on some of the ones that have come in, perhaps in this session, uh, and also maybe cover some of the questions that came in in the earlier session that were perhaps more um, appropriately allocated to the second part of the session about the programme. We've had a couple of questions around land ownership. Um, I think one from Louise Welsh, uh, who said she's interested in fragmented land ownership along the River Corridor, uh, and asking if the council who know, uh, know who owns and is there a register. I mean, the short answer to that is yes, we, we do know who owns all of the sites, and that's we can pick that up through land registry and various other um, databases that the council has access to in terms of ownership. We have identified this as a fairly significant challenge for the regeneration of the river corridor, um, because obviously in, a, in an ideal world, um, certainly we would have one owner uh, who was responsible for all of the land and all of the, the infrastructure of the river corridor, but sadly that's not the, the position that we're in. So we do know who owns the sites. The, the sites we've identified are largely uh, are, are not in council ownership, but we have uh, initial agreement in place by the owners of those sites to access them. Um, so hopefully that covers the answer to that question. Um, one or two people have identified specific sites that are perhaps out with um, the current programme or the initial pilot programme. Uh, without going into too much detail about it, the funding for this comes through the Scottish Government's Vacant and Derelict Land Fund where there are quite specific conditions about which sites we can uh, spend that money on. So it has to be on the vacant and derelict land register for, for 15 years. 
uh, which is quite a significant period of time and it rules out a number of sites. But certainly what we are hoping uh, is that this is very much a kind of pilot program to demonstrate how effective this can be in a, a similar way, I suppose, to the, the stalled spaces program, which started out very much as a small pilot program uh, and has now been running for more than 10 years, where we've been able to secure not a huge amount of funding, but some funding to be able to run that program every year because the because of the success of that project. So we hope very much to do something similar here, that this is the start of a, a program whereby we can um, almost introduce this kind of activation program depending on funding. You'll have, you'll have seen from Ziba's presentation that we're not giving huge grants, very similar, well, stalled spaces, which is perhaps at the kind of lower end of this scale, uh, up to about £4,000. But with that, we've been able to achieve some, some very successful projects. Um, so in, in that regard, I think that although the funding doesn't seem large, we think that we can achieve some quite interesting results with relatively small grant programmes. And you can see that through stalled spaces. Um, let me see what other questions that we've got in. With me. So I'll maybe pass this one to Ziba, and again, I think a lot of this will be picked up in the guidance as well, but we have a question from Thierry Lai, uh, I hope I'm saying that properly. If we are to take possession of a piece of land with temporary interventions, what should we take note of in relation to legal matters? We have public liability insurance, but only for their own premises. Um, so you can maybe cover a wee bit, Ziba, about uh, some of the kind of legal matters that run alongside this. Sure, Michael. Um, so, under um, as part of this program, uh, we will be asking for um, projects to have liability insurance coverage uh, for these specific projects as well. Um, and part of the funding um, can can be used to cover that as well. Um, in terms of other legal agreements um, for the use of the funding, there will be a legal agreement um, with the successful groups. And there will also be a, an agreement for the temporary use of the site um, with the landowners, between the groups and the landowners. Thank you, Ziva. Um, th there's been a few, a few sort of follow-up questions to, I suppose, the issue that uh, Minty was raising earlier around the, almost the kind of rights of the river and allowing the river to, um, I don't know if it go where it wants, it's quite the right description of it, but certainly that idea of, um, and this is something that we had, we've certainly looked at as part of the strategic development framework, is almost that kind of naturalisation, that the river was canalised uh, as a result of that requirement for industrialisation, and is this something in the longer term that we might be thinking about? I'm not sure it's something that we'll be able to address much through this project, because I think that's a, a kind of longer term project, but certainly we are looking at the, the possibility uh, of promoting the River Corridor as a sort of linear parkland, uh, and also as part of the kind of long term climate change and, and flooding uh, issues, where we can mitigate the potential flood impacts along the river. So these are very much uh, ideas that, that are very much at the forefront of our kind of longer term discussions. I'm not sure that the, the kind of smaller grant programme or this pilot will be able to address that entirely. But yeah, just to follow up on Minty's comments and I think a couple of follow ups that we've had on that, uh, I think specifically from Larissa and Naila, uh, yeah, this is very some very much something that we are thinking about in terms of, the, the, I suppose, the long term um, condition of the river corridor and how, we, how it addresses its banks in particular. Let's see what else we have. So we have a question from Avril Williamson. Uh, so what will be the mechanism or process for community-led projects? Again, I'll, I'll throw that one to you, Ziva. Um, so as I mentioned in the, um, in the presentation, there's an online application um, process. Um, the link for which we will send um, as part of the, you know, to all the attendees of the seminar as well as through our social media. Um, so on the web page, there's an online application pro, um, system um, that it, you can apply through, um, giving the details of the proposal, um, breakup of the funding, um, you know, what the plans are, etc. So um, that is the way uh, that you can you can apply to this program. 
Okay, thank you, Ziba. Um, I'll, I'll pick up on the next couple of questions, uh, hopefully. So there's a question from David Henderson, who's asked uh, about why why the focus on temporary uh, would the results not be more sustainable if longer term community influence spaces were developed? Um, and the, the short answer to that is yes, absolutely. I think we, in the longer term, we would look to get communities involved in the longer term activation program. And there are some of the kind of major development sites along the river corridor where there is the opportunity to do that. Uh, I suppose the purpose of this specific project is really to kind of demonstrate the art of the possible. Um, and as we've said, it's fairly relatively small scale in terms of funding. Um, so I suppose the idea of the temporary is almost to kind of demonstrate what perhaps could be achieved by more permanent um, interventions along the river corridor, along some of the key sites. And that's very much an aim of the strategic development framework to do that. Where there are sort of larger projects, we would certainly look to involve the community and, and consult communities in those programmes. So you can see that around some of the key developments in places like Water Row uh, and other places. And also, I think it's a key aim of the, the overall Clyde mission that I referenced earlier, um, the kind of Scottish government-led programme to, to reinvigorate the Clyde corridor. Uh, beyond the city. So I suppose the, the initial focus um, is on temporary, but I think yeah, very much the longer term focus would, would be on that sort of permanent activation uh, and involvement of communities along the river corridor. Um, but again, these are these are questions that we're happy to follow up uh, if you have any more thoughts on that or, or wanted to discuss that uh, after the meeting. Uh, and the other one I'd wanted to pick up on, I think, would come from Sue Hilder, who I know as a colleague has asked about activation of the river and uh, has suggested that there isn't much focus yet about activation of the actual water uh, and when is this likely to happen. Yeah, so again, I suppose similar to the last question, I think the initial focus through this particular funding stream is on vacant and derelict land along the river corridor. But um, in the strategic building framework, that's something that again, we are very keen to do is encourage more activity on the water itself. Um, so again, referencing the Water Row project, for example, we're looking very much uh, with the university about the potential for introducing some uh, activity on the water there, whether it be through canoeing or kayaking or water sports, where we can bring activity to the river uh, in a similar way that we've achieved on the, the Fourth and Clyde Canal, um, where you can see the kind of urban water park that's been created up there. Uh, we'd love to see tourist boats travelling back and forth along the river corridor. We obviously have that challenge in Glasgow that we have a tidal river, but the levels change quite dramatically uh, at times. So again, through the strategic development framework, this is something that we're very keen to pick up on. Uh, but yeah, it's a good point, Sue, and thanks for raising it. But as I said, the initial focus here and the, the nature of the funding is very much along, uh, focused on the spaces alongside the river, but that's something that we won't ignore going forward. Yeah, let me see. Apologies, I'm sort of scrolling through these questions that come up. I think hopefully we've covered most of the key questions that, that people have sent in. Yeah, I think, as I said, we've, we've covered hopefully most of the questions. Um, Mary Redmond has asked a question about, uh, or said, suggested that the main issue with some of the sites is the lack of key side barriers, uh, and has asked if GCC can help with making these safe. I think we would address that as and when projects come in. I think obviously that's something that we'll need to address as part of the of the project to ensure that obviously people are safe on these sites. So yes, that's very much something I think that we consider uh, as and when bids come in is to look at uh, safety along the along the river corridor. As I said, I think that's, I said, apologies, I'm scrolling through a, a rather small uh, box in my second screen looking at these questions. So hopefully we've covered most of them. What, as I've said, we are recording uh, the session, so the presentations will be available to everybody to access after. Uh, and we will also have a copy of all the questions that have been asked. So if there's any that we've missed out or uh, anything that we've not picked up, we'll be able to follow that up uh, post the event. Um, as Ziba has said, uh, any questions that people might have as they're starting to think about projects, please don't hesitate to contact us. 
uh, and we'll go back to you and give you as much support as we as we possibly can. Um, and I suppose now we're, we're very much throwing throwing it over to, to you guys to see what you can come up with um, and the ideas that you can generate for, for these sites. As I said, we've had a lot of success um, using temporary urbanism as a kind of mechanism across the city through the stalled spaces programme and we're hoping very much for, for something sim similar along the river corridor. Um, so over to you guys. Um, so in terms of the, the, the session itself, I think it just remains for me to thank you all for participating. I know that perhaps the, the online forum doesn't allow for as quite as full a discussion or the, the generation of ideas that we'd perhaps like. As we say, this is very much the kind of launch off point for this programme. So if there's anything you want to follow up on, uh, please just let us know. Uh, but it just remains for me to, to thank you all for coming. Thank you for the questions. Uh, some simpler than others to answer. And as I said, if, if there's any we've missed, we will get back to the answer. But just thank you very much for coming along to, to listen and participate in this session. Uh, and as I said, hopefully over the, uh, the coming months, we'll see some of these projects come to fruition on these sites. And we'll, we'll see you all on the River Clyde. Thank you very much.